Good afternoon. My name is Lloyd Pito. I'm from Wraith Company in Germany. I'm here to talk to you this afternoon, this evening, um, about iron beam lithography. Um, Tel Aviv and Wraith have recently entered into a collaboration to investigate this new and exciting technique. Um, the instrument you see here will be delivered to Tel Aviv um, within the next few weeks. Um, it's one of the first generation of this new type of instrument. It represents a new class of instrument. It's the first time lithographic techniques have been avail available to, for use with a focused iron beam. And I hope to show you some results from this technique that we've, um, we've done together so far and some results also that haven't been published yet. Um, so, um, iron beam lithography, as I say, is, um, is a natural sister to electron beam lithography, where we have already uh, a great deal of experience um, at Tel Aviv. So, what does iron beam lithography add for you as a researcher? What new capabilities do you now have access to um, for your own work? Well, you can apply an iron beam fabrication step now, automatically. This means once you've defined it, you don't actually have to be there while it's happening. If you remove the user from an iron beam process, you get something which is much more repeatable and much more accurate and you can apply it automatically to a wafer of devices. It's no longer a single site, single shot activity. The second part is that IBL is immediately able to be integrated with your conventional nanofabrication process. If you're used to using resists and exposures, uh, lift off, metal deposition, IBL simply augments that. You don't need to define a new process or do anything special in order to add IBL to your nanofabrication process. You can use the same tools. A standard GDS2 file may now contain optical lithographic steps, electron beam lithographic steps, and now iron beam lithographic steps within a single design. You simply activate different layers with different panels. You can do everything that an iron beam can do, but you can now do it as a lithography step. Iron beam steps are by definition three-dimensional. You're creating, uh, removing material, or you're adding material. Um, so a, while a standard lith lithographic platform may not uh, un uh, analyze samples in three dimensions, the, this IBL platform can do that. You can develop a pattern in three dimensions and analyze it in three dimensions in the same instrument. This is an important innovation for, for IBL. And of course, if you remove the, the soft animal between the keyboard and the chair, suddenly your process has become much more repeatable and much more accurate. Little outline for the, uh, for the talk. I'll just give an introduction about the concept of this instrument. A little bit about the hardware for those of you who are interested in such things, and then some applications. Why did Tel Aviv want to add iron line or iron beam lithography to their uh, techniques? Well, the first reason is, of course, that um, they wanted to make new nanostructures. And to do that, you need new nanostructuring techniques. And, of course, some conventional iron beam applications would be nice as well. There's an established history here of very high quality electron beam lithography. So it's natural to want to augment that, to take it to the next level by adding the next technique. Tel Aviv has a, a large uh, amount of cross-disciplinary support requirements. So life scientists, physicists, chemists, all want to create different types of nanostructures and may wish to create not just one, but hundreds or thousands of these nanostructures in order to analyze them properly. This requires a certain level of entry-level production type of mentality. 
And it was also found that conventional iron beam platforms have intrinsic limitations built into them. Conventional iron beam platforms are based on analytical instruments. They're based on scanning electron microscopes. So a more production-orientated platform was required. What is the concept of an IBL tool? Well, first and foremost, it's an automated patterning tool. Once you've developed your recipe, your protocol, your patterning, your uh, technique, you automate it to make it um, repeatable. You can now, it adds the ability to, that all iron beam processes may now be uh, done with a high precision and also with an automated step and repeat uh, capability. IBL has advanced scan strategies, much more than you'd find on a conventional iron beam tool, and also dose control, well into the sub-milling regime. It's not just a tool for digging holes in something or depositing metal tracks on something. It's also a technique for uh, functionalizing a surface or um, creating structures directly. It uses something we, we refer to now as live GDS2 editing. You can open a design with multiple lithography steps. You can select a single pattern from it, drop it onto your image, change the parameters, execute the pattern, analyze the product of the pattern, change the parameters again, execute and analyze again, and then drop the pattern back into your design and it will update the layer. It's a very active and dynamic way of creating a three-dimensional recipe. An IBL system is fib-centric. What does that mean? It means the iron column is vertical. This gives you much higher level of stability. It also means you can use much shorter working distances, which gives you better beam properties. Um, and of course, better resolution. Um, the fact that the iron column is normal to the sample means that you don't introduce stabilities by trying to tilt the sample. This, I think, is probably the most important especially for the life scientists in the room. You can apply an iron beam patterning step now without imaging the sample at all. Normally, you have to take an image so you can place your pattern on the sample. That's no longer required. Uh, an IBL system can simply collect alignment marks, either from the edge of your sample or from locally around where your device is, and then can apply your iron beam processing step with a few nanometers of precision without ever having captured or exposed that area to any type of ionizing radiation, ions, electrons, whatever. Because you are using the precision of a laser interferometer stage to position your sample. It's the first time a laser interferometer stage and an iron beam, a precise iron beam patterning tool, have been linked on the same platform. Conventional wisdom will say that a two column system would be a better approach you can have an SEM and a FIB coincident on a single location. But to do this, you have to image with both techniques in order to align them on a single point. If you now move your sample, you will always introduce a change in height, which means the technique which was normal to that location will probably still be accurate, but the technique that was tilted will never be accurate. You may not use one technique, the imaging of one technique, to position the uh, patterning capabilities of another technique. Coincidence is, is an illusion in this case. Of course, it permits large area patterning. You can take a design which is over several hundred or several thousand or even larger areas than this, uh, microns. You can break it into parts and deploy it, execute it piece by piece, stitching those parts very accurately together. And, of course, you can do continuous writing. If you don't wish to connect structures together with a, a normal accuracy of less than 10 nanometers, you can write continuous structures over millimeters of distance with no stitching at all, depositions or, or, or milling or exposure or functionalization. And finally, the ability to automatically collect alignment marks to position subsequent patterns and then deploy those patterns automatically. This is the concept of the IBL tool. It's quite different from a conventional instrument. So how do you navigate? If by imaging you're going to affect the sample, and any biologist will tell you there's no such thing as non-destructive imaging, 
Well, we do it like this. The first, uh, first thing we do is to load a sample holder. We know the exact dimensions of the sample holder, so we can navigate to exactly to your sample without having need, uh, the need to take any images at all. Step two, we have an optical microscope built into the instrument, which has the simulated perspective of a top-down imaging technique in the location of the iron column. So you're literally looking exactly down as you would be imaging with the iron beam. The, uh, the, 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 the structures you see here are, these small squares are one by one micron. So this is more than a sufficient magnification for you to find the corner of your sample, your first alignment mark, and of course, as soon as you found your first alignment mark, you can find all of them. The beauty of a laser interferometer stage is you can navigate anywhere with a few nanometers of accuracy. If you know your design, you have the design preloaded. You can navigate anywhere you want with just a few nanometers without having taken any images at all, except of alignment marks, which of course doesn't count. Right, so a little overview of the hardware. Of course, there's a 100 by 100 millimeter laser interferometer stage. The uh, productionized nanofib column, this was a framework six development um, from a, a French, French laboratory which we were a partner in, uh, a project we were a partner in. It has the uh, 20 megahertz pattern generator and of course dedicated um, software. The basic architecture is um, a lithography platform with an iron column uh, vertically mounted for high resolution, short working distance. Um, this is normal incident to the sample for stability and precision of navigation. Well, where is the microscope? The optical microscope. It's uh, at a tilted orientation on top of the sample, but it uses, I believe the term is a, a Scheinflug optical arrangement. So when the optical image it appears that you're normal to the sample and, um, and central, in the, uh, central to its location. The image you see here, this image here, is actually the image from the optical microscope. This is a calibrated image. You can navigate uh, on this image. Um, and it gives, this is the same orientation as the iron beam secondary electron image that you see here. So what are the applications that this combination of um, iron beam and laser stage um, can do for you? Well. Automated patterning across a wafer without ever having to take an image apart from alignment marks. This is quite new. What you see here is a two-inch diameter wafer uh, with a silicon carbide uh, layer deposited on top. It's been back etched to remove the silicon. So you see a number of small devices with silicon carbide freestanding windows. Silicon carbide membranes will not stand a single image from an iron beam microscope. The membrane will shatter uh, at this thickness. However, we were able to place a single pore at the center of these membranes automatically without ever having imaged the sample. And uh, these are what you see here. I'll have this example in more detail later on. Fabrication with stitching. Take a large design, break it into small parts, deploy it sequentially with a very high level of alignment between the components, less than 10 nanometer normally, um, and you can start to build things like large photonic arrays with very little uh, evidence of, of uh, you can't, there is a stitch line in the middle here, and the human eye is really good at spotting anomalies like that, um, but here you don't see them. For those of you not familiar with stitching, and there are, I'm afraid, many people still <laughs> who aren't, um, this is a little graphic just to show what it is. It's the ability to create uh, a much larger pan by putting together small components of it and stitching them together with very high level of accuracy. This requires a very precise stage, but it also requires a very orthogonal scan area. And this is uh, extremely important. Um, if, you don't, if, you're not, if your pattern is not square, you can't connect them together with a high degree of accuracy. Overlay is also extremely important. I have a sample. It's been patterned using optical lithography. It's been subsequently patterned using electron beam lithography. I now wish to add an iron beam lithographic step. These 
This shows uh, a process using automated realignment. So the system, the iron beam lithographic system, has simply found the features, found the alignment marks, re-registered, and now adds its IBL step on top of the EBL step. These are um, exposed, uh, developed uh, resist structures cre call, uh, created by EBL. We've removed the center of them uh, using IBL. Um, this is uh, 600 nanometers by 600 nanometers. So the box inside is 400 by 400. And again, the human eye is very good at spotting slight errors in such a structure as this, which is why we've used it. And you can see here the errors are extremely small. Here is an example of slightly larger features. These are two micron disks of developed resist. We've placed an iron beam cross in the center of them. Again, the human eye is very good at spotting errors in such, uh, uh, such structures. Um, and this was done using only global alignment marks around the edge of the sample and then navigating to the center of an array without having done any local realignment. This is an example of fixed beam moving stage, FBMS. This is a unique term um, to our company. This is the ability to move the sample over long distances while continuously writing. And just for those of you who are familiar with this, I have a small graphic to show this. The consistency and repeatability of this fixed beam moving stage writing mode is extremely high. I have an example to show you a little later on. The beauty of this is for things like waveguides where attenuation of stitched, uh, stitched fields would be, have a negative effect. This uh, continuous writing mode is um, very attractive for these long continuous structures. I think the longest structure we've written using this mode on an electron beam lithography system was something a little under 10 kilometers, uh, a large looping structure. And finally, of course, the laser stage allows you to mix and match EBL with IBL, you could, using even the same data file. IBL is a three-dimensional technique. These are standard two-dimensional sample holders, and this is how we achieve three-dimensional behavior. This is called the 3D module. It's a standard sample holder size. It has a central element here which can tilt up to 90 degrees, um, and a rotating element here as well. If you wish to do a highly precise lithographic step, the last thing you want to do is add degrees of freedom or, or, or drift, uh, sources of drift error to your sample stage. However, you do wish to be able to test patterns in three dimensions, section them, and image them by tilting and looking at the vertical face. You need to analyze them in three dimensions. This allows you to do that on a small piece of sample so you can um, finalize your process. And then you can unload your sources of errors, load a conventional sample, which, of course, um, doesn't have these additional uh, degrees of movement, and then deploy your IBL process with a much higher level of precision. So it's three-dimensional analysis when you want it. A little bit of information about the iron column. This is the productionized nanofib column. You see it here. This is the older version. This was the original uh, uh, development project, and this is the productionized version. Um, beam energy is normally 40 kilovolts. Uh, beam current range is half a picoamp to one nanoamp. The column is optimized for the low current, re current regime, the nano machining regime, if you will. Um, it's designed to work at short optical working distances for giving the highest resolution and smallest beam tails. We have a piezo-actuated mechanical aperture driver offering 14 apertures. So you have a large number of drills in your box, so to speak, for whatever pattern you wish to create. Some typical uh, deposition, minimum line width deposition, minimum line width milling, uh, typical imaging resolution. This is ion-induced secondary electron imaging, of course, um, and some beam stability and current stability data. We map and plan out the anomalies, the non-linearities in the orthogonal right field. This is extremely accurate when stitching orthogonal right fields together. Um, these are the errors in a 100 micron right field multiplied by 1,000 times in order for us to be able to see them in this graphic. And this will be a typical uh, specification that we hope to achieve, be able to, hope to be able to issue very soon. 
mean plus two sigma accuracy within a 50 micron right field of less than 20 nanometers. This means on a, on a statistical data point, you'll be able to place two right fields next to each other with less than six or seven nanometers of error. Obviously, there's a dedicated patch generator software, um, and this is a new mode specifically for IBL called patterning on imaging or microscope mode where we can where the instrument will imitate the behavior of a conventional line beam system in order to rapidly prototype a new pattern. Here's an example. This shows a simple iron beam image here with some simple patterns added and, and executed. You can see that these squares have been removed and then these patterns may simply be dragged back into your GDS2 design and used to update your entire pattern. Obviously, any successful recipes can be saved. We've also added this. It's called a live process monitor. Any iron beam pattern, in this case a simple rectangle, you can actually collect information from the pattern while it's being executed. In this case, you see the mottling of a chromium film as we machine through it. 20 nanometer chromium film is damaged by the iron beam as it's being removed. And as we go through, you see the mottling has been removed. We're now through the film. We're into silicon. Um, and uh, th this allows us to get some very quick and dirty endpoint detection information from within a pattern while it's, while it's active. Um, the instrument that's arriving here has the following hardware. Obviously a load lock for sample stability, the optical macroscope with this uh, shine flug optical arrangement. Um, there are two Cartesian nano manipulators which are capable of uh, extracting small pieces of your sample that have been cut out or for direct probing, electrical probing of features on the, on the um, or, or indeed adding uh, voltage or current to a device through the probe um, connected externally. There's also a gas injection delivery system with five chemistries loaded, um, allowing deposition and gas assisted etching using the iron beam. Um, um, of the sample. That's enough about hardware. Here's some applications images. Down the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see a fairly standard, simplified uh, uh, nanofabrication uh, process. You have a sample. You might add a layer. You might pattern that layer. You might add resist. You might pattern the resist, expose the resist. Use the resist as a mask for a subsequent patterning technique, a subsequent layer. You may add a hard mask and then remove that, and finally you have a pattern sample. And of course, if you wish to create a complex device, you can then go through this whole process again and again and again. Some, uh, uh, some modern semiconductor devices have several hundred of these steps, for example. Um, electron beam lithography adds value at this step in the nanofabrication process. It allows you to expose the resist with the pattern of your choice, and that resist is then used as a mask for whatever your step is. Iron beam lithography has a little bit more versatility. It's not dependent just on the use of resist. Um, you can add uh, 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 value to your nanofabrication process at all of these steps. You can first functionalize your, 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 your sample before you do any patterning, or you can directly pattern your sample without any uh, any other effects whatsoever, any other requirements whatsoever. You can expose resist directly as EBL can. You can mill developed resist to uh, modify it after it's been developed. You can uh, pattern a hard mask directly. You can pattern a layer produced from that hard mask directly. And of course, with your finished device, you can add electrical connections um, or machine it or tweak it or modify it um, as you see fit. These are typical workflows of each application here, uh, fabrication with resist, without resist, direct milling, and just surface science. The white crosses represent the IBL value step added to that nanofabrication process. To start with, functionali functionalizing a surface. Um, this is one example we've done. This is highly orientated graphite. We've added damage, single point damage using the iron beam um, to certain locations. This is not enough to remove material from the sample. This is only enough to damage the lattice at a certain location. The damaged lattice occupies more area, therefore you get a bump appearing 
at the sample lo at, at that location. This is an AFM result of that bump. This is this is because the instrument is calibrated into the submilling regime. Here um, we have 10 to the 4 ions per dot, um, and it's used in the, it was used in this case by a local university to do some um, directed self assembly during metal deposition. Uh, this will be something of the order of 10 nanometers. Another example is for uh, studies of magnetic nanolayers. We've patterned um, uh, a sandwich of magnetic nanolayers in order to um, separate uh, the domains. Um, this is the uh, sandwich components, and this is the damage there. We've intermixed these three nanolayers along the lines where the iron beam has patterned. Uh, this is a MOM image, a magneto-optical image, showing that neighboring, uh, neighboring magnetic domains can be in opposite spin directions because they're separated by the damage introduced by the iron beam. This is, um, has been published before. Here the dose is even lower than previously, 10 to the 3 ions per dot, so well into the submilling regime. Um, I'm very lucky to be able to show you this image. It's, we've just literally obtained it um, uh, last week. Um, this isn't published yet. It will be at three beams this year. Um, this is the direct production and, and of a continuously varying microfluidic mixer. Um, this is the unit cell. Um, at each point along the length of this, the cross-sectional area of this mixer is the same. So it goes from wide and thin to narrow and deep. Um, this allows you to mix materials together when there's no convection in the path of the materials. This is the GDS2 representation showing dose as a function of position. And here is the unit cell being added together. We've been able to remove uh, stitching effects. We've been able to remove uh, any iron beam um, artifacts from the, uh, from the path here. Um, uh, as I say, this, is, um, this has never been done before. So we're very lucky to have this image. Moving on to the direct resist, uh, exposure of resist. Um, iron beams, because they have such a small interaction volume, 40 kV, it's going to be something to do over 50 to 60 nanometers. Um, this is normal, bog standard, nothing, in it, nothing, nothing special, PMMA at 50 nanometers thickness. Here we've exposed, uh, exposed it with the iron beam and de subsequently developed it. These are 20 nanometer lines. This was our first attempt. Um, so this, uh, we have a partner with us who's working with us to develop this application in more detail. The neutralization of electrons to neutralize the positive beam? For charging, in case the sample charges. Yeah, we didn't see any charging effects in this case. The beam current, by the way, used was extremely low, uh, less than 5 picoamps. Uh, this, there is no guidebook you can buy about the iron beam exposure or photoresists, not like there is with EBL, okay? So this is quite new, and it is undeveloped and a, uh, an area where uh, a lot of work could be done. However, this, uh, shows, this image shows a 700 nanometer thick developed resist, optically uh, patterned in this case, um, um, and here... This shows how we've iron beam modified a developed resist. So you can take a, a resist structure produced by um, something of a, a lower resolution technique and turn it into a higher resolution mask in this case. And we do this using um, uh, a carbon milling etchant chemistry, which allows us to remove the, um, the, re the developed resist um, 30 times faster than conventional milling while suppressing the removal rate of the substrate material. This shows the combined GDS2 file, the blue elements of the optical lithography, the green elements of the iron beam lithography, uh, alignment marks as you see. We uh, collected uh, automated local alignment marks using image recognition. This is an image of one of those, and this is the, um, this is the modified resist structure again here. We can do it without collecting local alignment marks, just using the naked accuracy of the laser stage. This is an EBL and IBL combination. The blue disks are EBL disks, two microns in diameter, 700 nanometers thick. The green crosses are the IBL step, 
and this is the subsequent image captured from that. Here's the GDS2 file again. And we obviously don't just do this once here. It's obviously has to be done in an array. The direct milling of um, a patterning or of a hard mask. This shows a silicon nitride uh, coating on an indium phosphide buffer. Uh, we machine through the silicon nitride, allowing ingas to be grown at the location. The silicon nitride is then removed, uh, leaving just the ingas islands. This is a fairly low resolution example, one of our earliest attempts. Direct layer patterning. This shows a bow tie, an optical resonator made out of functional gold. Um, and the iron beam separation, we machined uh, a gap between this, this bow tie uh, feature here of a little under 10 nanometers. We also, by the way, created the entire structure. You can see these are iron beam patterns around here. So this was just a gold film, basically. We produced the resonator by directly machining it. You might say, well, that's nice, but it's nothing, nothing interesting because I can do this with EBL. You can't do it with EBL if, however, it's on the tip of an AFM. Um, this highly topographic sample um, can be directly processed with IBL. Fixed beam moving stage. This GDS2 pattern you saw in the background here is a one millimeter long path. It's 500 microns along here, then there's a 90 degree turn 500 microns along here. And at each end, we have this looping pattern. This was milled into a 20 nanometer thick chromium film on a, an insulative substrate. So this separates electrically this part from this part, um, but keeps it connected all the way along here up to this part. Um, so the iron beam here, the entire laser stage is moving. The iron beam is static in this case. Obviously, uh, no mechanical system is very accurate or super accurate, so we detect the non-linear behavior of the laser stage, the movement of it, with the laser interferometers and feed that information into the beam steering so we can draw straight lines when the stage itself is moving with very small errors. Um, this is done with high and low frequency compensation. This allows us to draw these very straight, very long lines um, without any errors creeping in. What's interesting is that this was, it's a millimeter in length, two millimeters to go back, and we looped around the pattern twice. So four millimeters total distance traveled with a 90 degree turn in the middle. So you have a large mass, over 100 kilograms of laser stage moving, decelerating, and then accelerating a different axis, and the beam steering is um, capable of um, adapting the beam path in order for this to happen without increasing or decreasing the dose at any point in the line. As I say, going over it twice with these dimensions shows the repeatability and accuracy of the fixed beam moving stage process. Incidentally, fixed beam moving stage has also been um, upgraded to the EBL um, instrument at Tel Aviv already as well. Uh, this is the example of the two-inch uh, wafer with silicon carbide. These are the windows. This is the wafer mat, the map the instrument was given, and asked the machine pause into only these devices. And this is the TM image of the pore, and the quality of the pore is the most important thing in this case. This is used for applications like biofiltering. Um, you can put anything you want through this thing, uh, DNA, RNA, things like that. Coming to the end of the presentation now, these are actually Tel Aviv. Uh, carbon nanotubes, and here we did single line depositions to, uh, this is an iron beam induced secondary electron image, very low current at a relatively low magnification, the damage to the nanotubes in this case is, is almost undetectable, well is undetectable. Um, you can add these single line depositions, in this case tungsten, for subsequent electrical connection, four point probe measurements, you can envision this happening. Um, this shows a three-dimensional inspection. Um, this is, again, a, a life science sample. These are peptide tubes, or so we thought. Turns out they're not tubes. They're, in fact, only hemispherical. They're half tubes, so to speak, with a void in the center. Uh, this is iron beam-induced tungsten deposition as a protective sacrificial layer added to the top surface. We then section through it, tilt the sample, in this case up to 80 degrees tilt, and then we can take 
ion beam induced secondary electron images at very low currents at very high resolution. In this case, uh, this was something of the order of 50,000 times. You can safely go up to something like 100,000 times and not significantly distort your information while capturing the image, uh, giving you good uh, high resolution imaging of the order of 5 nanometers. Um, so you can you can take these measurements, and of course, because you've cross-sectioned the device anyway, or the sample in this case, you, you don't need to use it again afterwards. So this is all done, obviously, in situ. So, uh, finally, what are the advantages of adding IBL to your existing EBL? Well, very similar hardware platforms, the patenting steps are almost identical, and of course, the performance is very similar. IBL adds the direct milling, gas-assisted etching, and iron beam-induced deposition capabilities that iron beams bring, and you can add that to direct patterning by electron beam-induced deposition. You can expose resists up to 50 nanometers thick with IBL, but you can trim develop resists up to almost any thickness. Typical resist exposures with EBL are of the order of 1 to 1.5 microns thick. The IBL can intermix layers, inject damage, remove layers, EBL won't do those things. IBL is two-dimensional and a three-dimensional process, but also can be applied to topographic and flat samples. EBL is fast, many times faster than IBL, um, but it's a two-dimensional process on a two-dimensional sample. IBL allows you to create and quickly check in 3D the samples, the results you wish to obtain. IBL allows you to very quickly check top-down results that you've obtained as well. Combining these techniques gives this extra layer of functionality. Um, so, and specifically interesting to the researcher is um, the ability to enable novel new nano devices. This is my first slide. You really can add an iron beam step automatically to an entire wafer of devices. You can do it as part of your standard lithographic process. You can do it using your standard tools. You can add all this additional functionality as part of that process. You can do it in 3D, and you can check it in 3D. And finally, of course, you can do it without the user. So, thank you very much. Your instrument will be arriving shortly. Any questions? Uh, about two to three weeks. Great. Thank you.